Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. Or if you're new here, welcome to my channel. So today's video is going to be yet another video on the quadruple murder that took place at the University of Idaho in Moscow, Idaho. We finally have the arrest affidavit for Brian Kohlberger, so we finally know the details from the night that these murders took place, as well as how he was ultimately caught then there is further information about if he contacted the victims and things like that. So for this video, I'm just going to be picking up right where we left off. In the previous three videos, we discussed each one of the victims, including Zana Kernodal, Ethan Chapin, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee Gonsalves, who were all murdered in the early morning hours of November 13th, 2022. We know that Brian Kohlberger was apprehended on December 30th while he was in Pennsylvania. He was then extradited to Idaho on January 5th, and after that, the arrest affidavit was released detailing everything that led to his arrest. So first, I'm going to detail the events that took place on the night of the murder according to the affidavit, then I'm going to discuss the subsequent investigation and information that we have, all that points towards Brian's guilt. If you want a more detailed timeline of the time of events before the murders and who each of the victims were as well as who Brian Kohlberger is, make sure you go ahead and check out the three other videos that I've made on this case this far. As we know from before, after the four victims went out for the night on November 12th, they each returned home just before 2 a.m. on November 13th, 2022. As we know, Zana and Ethan were at a frat party arriving at around 9 p.m. and they stayed until around 1.45 a.m., returning to their home shortly after. Then we know that Kaylee and Madison were at a local bar called The Corner Club from around 10 p.m. until 1.30 a.m. After that, they went to a local food truck and then left after getting their food, returning home at around 1.56 a.m. It was said that Maddie, Kaylee, and Ethan, as well as the surviving roommates, were most likely in their rooms or asleep by 4 a.m., However, Xana actually received a DoorDash order at around 4 a.m. So we know that one of the surviving roommates was woken up at around 4 a.m. to what she thought sounded like Kaylee playing with her dog in a room on the third floor. A short time after that, the surviving roommate stated that she heard someone who she thought was Kaylee saying, someone's here. However, it was shown that Xana was awake at the time. She was shown to be using the TikTok app at around 4.12 a.m., and again, she had just gotten an order on DoorDash. So it's possible that it was Xana saying this, or it was Kaylee saying that someone's here, but it could have just been the DoorDash driver, and obviously she was just on high alert because maybe she didn't know that Xana was ordering DoorDash, so obviously the sound of a door opening at four in the morning is going to alert someone but it's possible that this was the DoorDash driver, but it's also possible that it was Brian. The surviving roommate said that she looked out of her door when she heard the comment about someone being in the house, but she didn't see anything at this time. Shortly after that, however, the roommate said that she opened the door for the second time because she heard what she thought was the sound of someone crying from Xana's room. After that, she heard what sounded like a male voice saying, it's okay, I'm going to help you. Once again, it's possible that this was Ethan saying this because maybe she thought that someone was in the house and, you know, Ethan was trying to be the strong guy and saying, I'm going to help you, you know, no one's there, whatever. Or once again, it could have been the intruder saying this. Now, there is a neighbor that had a security camera, which was located about 50 feet from the west wall of Zana's bedroom. At 4.17 a.m., the camera picked up a distorted audio of what sounded like voices or a whimper, followed by a loud thud. Also starting at that time, security footage picked up the sound of a barking dog. After hearing more sounds of crying, the roommate said that she opened up her door for the third time when she saw what looked like a dark figure wearing black clothing. She said that this person was male, standing at 5 feet 10 inches tall or taller, not a very muscular build, but he was athletically built. He was wearing a mask that covered their nose and mouth, and he had bushy eyebrows. The roommate said that she was standing there in a state of frozen shock. She stood there as the figure just walked right past her. 
this individual walked towards the sliding glass door of the house and allegedly left that way. After that, the roommate locked herself in her room, once again, just frozen in fear. It's thought that at this time, the four other roommates had already been murdered and the roommate saw the man who was fleeing the scene at that time. There has been a lot of discussion on whether or not this man saw the roommate, whether he walked past her and didn't notice that she was there or walked past her and saw her there but just chose not to do anything to her for whatever reason. But from what I can tell, I personally don't think that he saw her. I think that in the moment of just having committed this act, he was just in a zone of wanting to get out of that house and wasn't even paying attention to the other roommate that was standing there. But I could be wrong. Let me know what you all think about that. So that is what we know about the actual night that the murder took place. Now let's talk about the other information that was found on surveillance video and cell phone data. Police found that there was a white sedan, which we now know was that white Hyundai Elantra. This vehicle was captured driving on the street near the house at around 3.26 a.m., then on State Highway 95 at 3.28 a.m. After that, the same car was seen driving back and forth in front of the house on King Road, so this house that the four victims lived in. It made three passes back and forth starting at 3.29 a.m. Then, by 4.04 a.m., the same car is seen driving in front of the house once again where it appeared to either try to park or turn around in front of the house. The car then drove down the road and then made a three-point turn on a neighboring street. Then, by 4.20 a.m., the car is seen again, this time leaving the area at a high rate of speed. It's then seen traveling out of the neighborhood and then this car travels down the road that leads to Pullman, Washington, which is about 10 miles away from Moscow, Idaho. The same car is seen arriving to Pullman at around 2.44 a.m. Then at 2.53 a.m., the car is seen arriving to the Washington State University campus. The car was last seen between 5.25 a.m. and 5.27 a.m., traveling around different streets at the WSU campus. After seeing these surveillance videos of this white Hyundai Elantra, police did do a search of all of the cars with this description in the area. His name did come up with one of these searches with his car being identified as having Pennsylvania license plates. After that, an officer at WSU located the vehicle in an apartment complex and obviously the license plate came back as being registered to Brian Kohlberger. They found out that five days after these murders, the license plate on the car had been switched from Pennsylvania license plates to Washington plates. After finding out what Brian looked like according to his driver's license, police made the connection that Brian matches with the description given by the surviving roommate of the man who was in her house that night. Then they found out that Brian had been pulled over in Latah County, Idaho back in August. At this time, Brian gave officers his phone number. So then, using that phone number, police were able to track his cell phone pings. So, using that cell phone number, police were able to track his cell phone pings. Police found out that at 2.42 a.m. on November 13th, 2022, Brian's phone pinged on a tower near Pullman, Washington, near his residence. The phone is then seen traveling southeast through Pullman at 2.47 a.m. Around the same time, the phone is either shut off or it reaches an area where there is no cell service. It's assumed that the phone was shut off at this time. The phone was not connecting to towers for a couple of hours, once again, meaning that it was probably shut off, only turning back on or connecting to cell service once again at around 4.48 a.m. Then, between 4.50 a.m. and 5.26 a.m., the phone is seen traveling on Highway 95 towards Genesee, Idaho, and then back towards Pullman, Washington, towards Brian's residence. After this, his cell phone records are consistent with the surveillance video captured of the white Hyundai Elantra traveling on the WSU campus at around 5.27 a.m. By 9 a.m. on November 13th, 2022, Brian's cell phone records show that he is once again near the residence in Moscow, Idaho. 
He is there between 9.12 and 9.21 a.m., and then his phone is seen traveling back towards Pullman at around 9.32 a.m. So clearly, this shows that about five hours after the murders, for whatever reason, Brian returned back to the area of the house and was there for about 10 minutes. This was before the roommates called 911, so Brian would have seen that the residence was still calm and no police were present. Then, police looked further into his cell phone records to see if he had any communication with any of the victims and to see if he had any prior interactions with their home before the murders. This showed that his cell phone had been in the location of their house 12 times before the murders on November 13th. All of these occasions, with the exception of one, were all either in the late evening or early morning hours on their respective days. Also, we know that when he was pulled over back in August, that was actually one of the times that he had been around that home. Now, let's talk about the evidence that investigators found at the scene after 911 was called that day on November 13th at around noon. When police first arrived, they found that Xana's body was on the ground inside of her room near her bedroom door, right next to a bathroom door. Then, Ethan's body was also found in Xana's room, once again, I believe, on the second floor. Police then walked up to the third floor of the residence. As they walked into Kaylee's bedroom, they found the bodies of Kaylee and Madison laying in Kaylee's bed together. I believe Kaylee's dog was also found in her room with them. Next to Kaylee's bed, investigators found a leather knife sheath laying on the bed next to Madison's right side. The sheath belonged to a Kabar-style knife with the U.S. Marine Corps Eagle and Globe anchor stamped on the outside of it. On this knife, they found DNA that belonged to a single male profile. It is thought that it's possible that when the girls heard someone coming into their house, they got scared, so Madison went into Kaylee's room. Maybe this is also around when they called Jack so many times because they were afraid that somebody was in their house. Maybe that was when they heard cries coming from Xana and Ethan's room. I don't know for sure, obviously, but we do know that investigators said that they appeared to be asleep when they were murdered, so we don't know exactly for sure yet. Investigators found a bloody shoe print from a male shoe that was thought to be a Vans-type shoe. This shoe print was located just outside of the door of that surviving roommate. So, the roommate who saw him walk right past her, there is a shoe print right in front of her door. So, once again, what does this mean? We don't really know, but we know that it's consistent with the direction that the roommate said the man was walking in. We don't know if this tells us that she was confronted by him. We don't know if that means that he actually saw her. We don't know anything about what he was thinking in that moment. Other than that, he just stepped in front of her door and left after that. Some people have speculated that he saw the roommate, but he was so hellbent on getting out of there because maybe there were more people than he expected. Some people say that he was in the zone and just wanting to leave, and that is how he started making such stupid mistakes like leaving the knife sheath and not seeing the other roommate. So, that's very possible. Some people have said that they think that he chose this house to kill as many people as possible to be like, you know, highly regarded as this mass murderer. But at the same time, if that was true, you'd think that he would have checked all of the rooms and make sure that there's no one that survived. So, I don't think he would have left a witness on purpose. I don't think he would have saw her and been like, not going to kill her. I'm just going to get out of here. I think he would have wanted to kill any witnesses. So, I personally don't think that he saw her. Either way, after police identified Brian's car and his cell phone records, police tracked down his parents' house and they searched through the trash at his parents' house in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. That is how they were able to obtain a sample of DNA. This was then sent off to the Idaho State Lab for testing and this sample came back as a 99.9998% probability of the profile being the biological father of the suspect. So, the father of Bride Kohlberger. That is how they were able to match the DNA from the sheath to Brian. So, that's what led investigators to finding Brian and arresting him. 
There is a lot of speculation around how he knew the four roommates, if he noticed that surviving roommates that saw him, like I said, or even how he accidentally left the knife sheath there. That is information we don't yet know. There is speculation to say that he returned to the house to retrieve the knife sheath that he left behind, but he just couldn't get the courage to go back in there. Others say that he just wanted to check out the scene to see if police arrived. Others said that maybe he just wanted to go back in to see his victims once again and that he just didn't get the courage to once again. We don't know that information yet. Shortly after this affidavit was released, news sources started reporting that Brian was reportedly messaging one of the victims before their deaths. This is something that has kind of run wild on the internet, but the families have said that he didn't know the victims and they didn't know him. So we don't even know which of the victims he was allegedly trying to message. I don't even know how true this information necessarily is since it was just reported by an anonymous source, but the way that investigators are speaking about it, it does seem like this holds some sort of merit. So the source says that he slid into one of the girl's DMs several times, but she didn't respond. The source basically just said that he kept saying, how are you? But he did that again and again and again. A lot of women I'm sure have similar situations where this guy is just messaging you like, good morning, how are you, what's up? Over and over and over and over again and you just don't respond either because you don't see it or because you don't want to. Authorities say that he was messaging this victim around the same time that he was stalking them, but they aren't sure why the roommate or the victim did not respond. It could just be that they didn't see his request if they went to the request folder in their social media. But it was stated that Brian did follow all three of the girls in that house on social media. So there's no telling which one he messaged, if he messaged all three of them, how he even found their profiles, how he knew about them. We still don't know that information. Investigators are still working to find out how exactly he knew them and if they even knew of his existence. In my previous video, we discussed that Brian was a doctoral student studying criminal science and he had just previously posted a research study in hopes of getting into the minds of people who commit crimes. To hear more about that aspect of the case, make sure you watch the previous video that I made on this case. But either way, we know that Brian seemed to know a lot about criminal justice and about crimes, and he probably got a lot of respondents to his research study talking about what they were thinking when they committed their crimes. So, people have speculated that maybe he's doing this for a research study, which even if that is his motive, I don't agree that it was for science. I think that he wanted to do it whether or not he was studying criminal justice. Maybe he was studying criminal justice because he already had these sick tendencies. We don't know these things yet. We don't know if we will ever know them. But some people have said that because of the fact that he was studying criminal justice that, you know, he really didn't think that he was going to be caught and that he took this risk of killing all of these people because he didn't think he was going to get caught. Or, on the other hand, some people think that he knew he was going to be caught and he just wanted the attention from being infamous and wanted, you know, people to know that he killed all of these people. But again, I don't know if I think that part is true just because he would have probably tried to kill all the roommates. Maybe he went in there to try and kill all the roommates and when he realized that like he might be screwed because maybe he heard another roommate calling the police. I don't really know. But either way, I think that there was something that happened that either made him leave, that he felt like he couldn't finish the rest of the victims, or he just didn't know that they were there. Either way, Brian sat in court for a hearing on January 12th, 2023, and here he was charged with four charges of first-degree murder and one charge of felony burglary. At this hearing, he was denied bond due to the severity of the crime and the fact that he had fled the state just after the crime had been committed. At this time, Brian said that he understood the charges against him and he waived his right to a speedy trial. His next trial hearing is set for June of 2023. It was also pointed out by media personnel attending the hearing that it did appear that Brian had scratches on his face, so that's definitely an interesting aspect of this.
Mr. Koberger understands his right to a timely preliminary hearing, and he's willing to waive the timeliness to allow us time to obtain discovery in this case and be prepared. And Mr. Thompson, are you in agreement with that? Uh, the state has no objection to that, Your Honor. So, Mr. Koberger, I need to speak to you for a moment then. Sir, you do understand, and Ms. Taylor has represented here, that she's advised you of your right to have, um, or fully discussed with you, the right that you have, which is to have your preliminary hearing within 14 days of the date that you initially appeared before this court. As you recall, uh, when I advised you of your rights, that hearing is a probable cause hearing where the state has to establish that more likely than not, these felony offenses were committed and you were the one that committed the felony offenses. If you waive your right to a speedy preliminary hearing, it does not mean that you're giving up your right to have a preliminary hearing. It simply means that you would not be able to come back and challenge that the state did not present probable cause within 14 days. Do you understand? Yes. Have you had enough time to speak with Ms. Taylor about your decision to waive your right to a speedy preliminary hearing? Yes. Do you need any additional time to do so? No. Then I will ask at this time, as to the five counts, felony counts, that were charged in the uh, criminal complaint that was filed on December 29th of 2022, are you waiving your right to a speedy preliminary hearing and agreeing that that hearing can be held outside the 14-day period? Yes. And Ms. Taylor, do you concur with his waiver? I do, Your Honor. Thank you. I will find your waiver of speedy preliminary hearing is knowing, intelligently, voluntarily entered here in open court with the assistance of counsel. We will go ahead and set the matter for a preliminary hearing beginning <coughs> Monday, June 26th at 9 o'clock a.m. And I will go ahead and reserve uh, the week, so June 26th to June 30th, in the event that uh, we need all five days for presentation of evidence. Is there anything further to address at this time in the case, uh, Mr. Thompson? Uh, not from the state's perspective, Your Honor, no. All right. Or Ms. Taylor? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Koberker, then you will be remanded into custody on your same no bail at this point in time, uh, pending further proceedings. Again, we'll send notice out to council, and we will be in recess for this morning. Thank you, Your Honor. The courts have also issued a gag order on this case, which limits the information that can be shared with the public or the media in regards to this case. This order, quote, specifically prohibits those listed from relaying information that includes evidence in the case, the character, credibility, or criminal record of the party involved, the results of any examinations in the case, and any opinions on the merits of the case, and anything that might impact a fair trial, including statements, confessions, and admissions given by 28-year-old Brian Kohlberger, or information on plea deals. So that is what we know on this case right now. This most likely will be the last video I make on this case for quite some time due to the fact that we probably won't hear much more until his trial, which won't take place for a few months. But you guys know if there is any more information that comes out, if there is anything that happens with the trial, I will be watching the trial and reading and finding out any information that I can and you guys will be the first to know. I did sit on the affidavit for a little bit. I know it came out a couple weeks ago or maybe a week or two ago at this point, but I wanted to sit on it. I wanted to read it, make sure I understood it. I wanted to do a little bit more research, find out if anything else was going to come out after this affidavit came out and more information did come out, so I'm glad I waited a little bit. So that's why I waited a couple of weeks or a couple of days to make this video, but that is all the information that we know right now. I am so curious to hear what Brian will say about all of this, though right now I do think that he is maintaining his innocence. I don't want to speculate too much on this case, as I say in pretty much any case that I cover. I don't want to assume anything based on how he knew the victims, who the target was, or anything like that. I've been sort of going through some of the rumors in this case throughout this video, just saying that this is what people are saying. 
but I'm also letting you guys know that we don't know any of those answers yet. So if you do see a source saying like, hey, he knew this person and this is what he did and this is why, or this is why he's innocent or this is why he's guilty, other than what we know with this affidavit and any information that's actually like credible released by the police, we don't know anything about his motives. We don't know anything else beyond what we know in this affidavit. So just take any new information you are seeing with a grain of salt as I did with the fact that he may have been messaging these girls. We don't know who. We don't know how credible that is. So I just wanted to point that out from the jump. Misinformation runs rampant on social media. So again, just be careful with what you believe and what you are spreading. Again, there has been so many questions surrounding his motive, whether he just wanted to be a prolific killer and that's why he did it. Though, again, I don't know because he wouldn't have let those two roommates survive if he just wanted to kill as many people as possible. Again, we've also seen that he went in to target one person who some people believe is Xana at the point because of the fact that she was killed first. But again, we don't really know. To me, it seemed like he must have known who lived in that house, how many people were there, and how many people were coming in and out all the time because of the fact that it was a party house. He clearly stalked them. I think he saw each of the roommates come into the house and he waited to go in, hence us seeing him driving back and forth. I think that he was waiting until the lights turned off or he thought that all of them were in their rooms and he waited until he assumed that they were asleep. Maybe after the DoorDash order got there, he knew that, you know, that was probably going to be the last thing that they were doing for the night. So he waited enough time until he thought, you know, she was done eating and then he came in. I'm not exactly sure. We know that he stalked them for several months before that as well as the night of but other than that, we don't exactly know. None of us are exactly sure of that information. So again, I know I keep saying this, but beyond that, I'm not going to speculate about what I think his motive was or anything else like that. It's still way too early to tell based only on what we know right now. And as you know, I don't wanna put out information out there unless it's been confirmed. So again, that is where I'm going to leave this case. I am very, very happy that the families finally have the answers that they've been needing. I'm glad the police officers in this case did do their due diligence in tracking down Brian and arresting him. I'm glad that the families didn't have to wait years or even months for their answers. I'm happy that the families of these victims can sleep at night knowing that the person who is likely responsible is behind bars. I'm looking forward to knowing what the defense is going to be on this case. I've seen in one source that Idaho does not have the insanity plea, so that's not something that he can do. Once again, I've seen so much speculation about people online saying that, you know, they know Brian or claiming to be his family members or whatever and coming up with these stories that supposedly are proving his innocence. It's ridiculous. And again, I won't partake in that. But again, if you do see someone saying like, hey, I know Brian personally and da 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 da, I'm Brian's, you know, family member, I'm his cousin, I'm his friend, whatever. This is why he couldn't be innocent. Just take all that information with a grain of salt. I do want this case to be sort of a lesson as to where you get your information from and why it's dangerous to speculate and blame people for being involved just based on the very limited information that police are giving out. I'm sure that the roommates are absolutely so traumatized, not only from what they had to go through with their friends being murdered, but also for the people online blaming them for being responsible. I hope that this can serve as a lesson not to jump to conclusions about the police either. So many articles just weeks after the murders jumped out there saying that police are doing nothing and that they know nothing, when in reality, behind the scenes, they were working their tails off to find justice for these four murdered college students. This isn't a dig at the family whatsoever because I can definitely understand them being frustrated with the lack of information, but society as a whole, when they're not telling us stuff, that might be because they don't want us to know and it might be for a reason. So again, please just be kind to the families. Keep your speculations and assumptions to yourself and just wait until we know more about the facts before going on and telling your theories. And for this, I'm not blaming the viewers of true crime content. I'm also blaming true crime creators as a whole because we can do a lot better. If you are a fellow creator, just know how harmful it is when you choose to speculate and put out information that may not be true. When you put out information that has not been confirmed. When you are saying your own theories based on Reddit forums or people claiming to know information that hasn't been confirmed. It's harmful 
and I just want us to do better as a community. There's nothing wrong with having theories, but as long as you state, this is just a theory, this is just my thoughts, which I know a lot of creators are really good about doing, but as long as people know that these are just your thoughts and that this isn't confirmed information, that's okay, but just putting out information that could confuse people or things to just get more clicks or to get more views or whatever, that's very harmful. So as a whole, I think we can do a lot better. But with that, that is where I'm going to get off my soapbox and end this video. Thank you all so much for being here with me through this insane case. I look forward to the trial that comes out of all of this and any more information that we're able to find out because of that trial. But if you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. Twitter is where I follow the most closely to any case that I cover on this channel. So for the most recent updates, make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter. If you have absolutely any case suggestions of cases that you'd like to see covered on this channel, make sure you go ahead and fill out the Google form that I have listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.